Ever wondered what motivates people to get plastic surgery? Did they regret it? What can we learn from the stories of plastic surgery patients? We're here to explore those questions and get some answers today with my guest Kennedy on the Plastic Surgeon Podcast. Hello, my friends. Welcome back. And thanks to all our listeners for the amazing feedback. We have had so much fun and so far and look forward to more of your insights and suggestions. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts to help us get you more awesome content. On the Plastic Surgeon Podcast, we listen to real plastic surgery stories of triumph and pain from real patients and providers to further understand the motivations of why they would risk their life under the knife. I'm Dr. Javad Sajjan, and today I have the amazing Kennedy. Kennedy, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing amazing. That's Thank good. you. We are here to talk to you about your journey, how we came to know each other, the procedure you underwent, and how it affected you. So for all of our listeners and fans, Kennedy is such an amazing person. Kennedy is transgender. She, her gender identity is female. She was male assigned at birth. Kennedy came to me for breast augmentation. We're going to talk about that surgery, why we did it, how we did it. Before we get there, we want to get to know Kennedy because she's such an amazing person. Someone I really had the privilege to get to know. So Kennedy. What was your gender assigned at birth again? Um, gender assigned at birth was male. And, and where did you grow up? Where was your childhood? Um, I grew up in a small town of Southern Virginia. It's called Danville, Virginia. I never shout that out. <laughs> <laughs> when people ask where I'm from, I usually say Richmond because that's where I went to school. Like I'm like, oh, I'm not from Danville, but I'm from Danville, Virginia. And did you grow up with both uh, a mother and a father? Yes, I did. I grew up with both of parents. Um, my father was actually a pastor, grew up in the church, and my mom was like heavily in the church. She sang in the choir. Um, and I grew up with uh, a younger brother and a younger sister. And then later on, my mom adopted another kid, and then we had, had a, like another little brother. Wow. Were you involved in the church during your childhood? Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Uh, it wasn't a great experience for me um, just because in the beginning, like in the beginning stages, it was uh, I was in the choir. I sing. I love to sing. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was like my like calling for that. And then as I got older and started coming into myself and like realizing who I was as a person, it was just not like the people there weren't accepting me. And like it just went downhill. So. Mm -hmm. So when did you start realizing your gender assigned at birth wasn't your gender identity um actually so the gateway drug i guess you could say to me like figuring out like myself as a person was youtube um i like was big into youtube at the time and how like, old were you i was about i want to say like 16 and what were you doing on youtube um i was following a lot of trans youtubers um like gg gorgeous and um like Angela Vanity and uh, at the time their name was John Lou, but I think they're, I forgot their, uh, Elena Genevieve, that's her new, that's her uh, new um, YouTube name. Um, but I was following all of these like trans YouTubers and I was seeing that they were like young and teenagers and they were like living their life and living their truth. And like, I had already known that like something wasn't right about me and how I identified um, because at a very young age, like I tell people this all the time, when I was in first grade, I used to tell people I was a girl. I used to go around and tell my friends that, hey, actually I'm a girl, but my parents want me to pretend to be a boy. I had no idea what transgender was. I had no idea what it was, but I would tell people that all the time. And when I went to school, I would always wear these cowboy boots because they had a little heel on them. And mm -hmm. I love hearing them click when I would walk down the hallway. And so like, as I got older, I was like, wait, what was I talking about really when I was a kid? Like, did I like already know when I was young? And so just like watching people live their truth on like my computer really helped me like figure out myself a little bit more. And did your parents know that you were doing this? No, <laughs> my parents had no idea. Um, I think the only person who had like somewhat an idea was my brother because we shared a room. Mm. And so my brother like kind of knew, but he also kind of didn't care. Um, and so if anything, he knew that like I was a gay man. Like he knew that like mm. hands down <laughs> um, at the time. But yeah. And on YouTube, why did you start following the transgender accounts? I don't know. Like, I think it was just like 
one of those things where it just came up in my recommended because like I did follow like a lot of like queer YouTubers at the time. And then like, then I was like, oh wait, what's this loop God, like rabbit hole? And I went down this rabbit hole and was like, oh wait, there's like people that like feel how I feel. Um, so yeah, it was definitely kind of like that. So at first grade, you started having feelings that your gender wasn't congruent. Mm -hmm. And what and you looked on YouTube. Was there anything else that happened between first grade and 16? Um, well, between like so during um so by the time I hit sixth grade, trigger warning, uh, sixth grade, I was like sexually assaulted by my cousin. Um, and it like changed my world. Like I like I like went through this whole depressive spell. Um, and um I had to go to counseling. And was your was your and you were your gender identity was male at that time. Mm -hmm. And was your cousin male? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Do you, um, you can share with us as much as you want. Do you mind telling us what happened? Yeah. So basically what ended up happening was we were at my, my mom had left me at my grandparents' house um, for like the summer. My parents went to Vegas for their like, like it was their little, oh, parents trip thing. Um, and my grandmother had went into the grocery store and my grandmother had a van, like a really big van, like a church van. Cause she drove, mm -hmm. she would pick up the kids for her church and like take them to school. So she just drove the van all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we were in the car and then like, I was already like, I had questions and I had asked him questions just because I was curious. And I was like, cause I had already at that time I was like middle school, like middle schoolers have questions. And so I kind of came to him as like, a grown, like, 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 it's like, can you help me like understand like, why do people feel this way? Like, why is it this? And then it kind of happened where he took advantage. He was like, oh. How, how old was he? Uh, I think he, he wasn't like, cause I was in middle school. He was like in high school. So you were in your like 12, 13 and he yeah, was Yeah, he was 16, like 16, 17. Yeah. And, um, and you were asking him, why do I not feel like, why do I like men? Or what were you Yeah, asking? I was like, why do I like boys? Like, yeah. Like, and then I was like asking him like, oh, like, why do I like boys? Is that okay? Da, da, da. And then it, it turned from less of a, um, like, let me educate you to let me show you. What did you do? And then so like, basically like he like penetrated me in the van while my grandmother was like in the grocery store. Um, and then like after that happened, he like looked at me, he was like, you don't tell anybody this. And so I was just like, oh crap, oh crap. Like, cause the, it's middle school and middle schoolers are mean already. Like they call everyone faggot. They like are very mean. Yeah. And so having this happen to me, I was like, oh my God, like this hurts so much. And then so. So he, he grabbed you or threw you on him or how did, how did it happen? It, he or? forced himself on me. So like, I was just like, ah, and like, it just like happened. But like, I was young. So like, I was just like, oh my God, like, I don't know what's going on. Mm. Um, And then so basically like, I like, from sixth grade to about like seventh grade, like that whole year, like I was like having like moments. Like I was like, oh my God, like what is going on with me? Like, like, is it my fault that this happened to me? And like blaming myself for it. And then Who I did, like- Did you tell anyone this happened? So here's how, here's, here's what happened. Um, I met, so I pulled my dad aside and mind you, my dad's a pastor. And I was just asking questions, like, because I didn't want to tell him it happened, but I was asking questions. And I said, Dad, what happens if two guys have sex? And my dad looks me in the eyes and says, they get AIDS and they die. And so at the time, I was like, at that point, I was convinced I had HIV, I had AIDS. Because I was like, wait, my cousin did this to me, so that means I have it. And so from sixth grade to seventh grade, I was like beating myself up, coming home from school, crying, like thinking like, oh my God, like I'm going to die. I'm going to be like one of those like kids on the TV, like oh, like this, every Sunday, like for a penny a day, you can help a kid. Like I was like, I'm that kid. So like my sixth grade mind is like, oh my God, what's going on? And then so I like had just like a breakdown. And then in seventh grade, I like came to my parents and I just like told them, I was like, this is what happened to me. And then their first reaction was, oh, well, we got to get counseling. And then so I got stuck in counseling. Did something happen to your cousin? Did they do anything? No, they slept under the rug. They didn't want anyone to find out. They didn't want anyone to know. They told his parents and then it was it. Like that that was it. That It just ended. It just ended. Like that was it. Like it never got fixed. Nothing ever happened from that. Um, and the weirdest thing about that is like now me and this cousin, like I'm someone who I'm very forgiving. Mm -hmm. I'm a very forgiving person. I believe in second chances and I believe that people fuck up. And like, I had to like basically grow up and like come to the fact that we were both children. We were both young. I know people do fucked up stuff, but 
I I forgive you. I was like, but I won't forget. So me and this cousin, when family events come up, we're very cordial. You know, we're very cordial. We're, we're like, you know, it's not, I don't ever bring it up. We don't ever talk about it. But it's just one of those things where I won't ever forget. But at the same time, like, I will forgive you. Because I'm that type of person. Yeah, you have a big heart. Yeah. A lot of people couldn't do that. A lot of people can't. And so it's like really hard to look the person in their eyes and be like, hey, I forgive you. He raped you. Yeah. And so like, I was just like, I, and I actually had that conversation with him when I was like only like 19. Like. What did you tell him at 19? I was just like, hey, I was like, obviously the situation never got fixed. I was like, or talked about. I was like, but I just want you to know, like, like. I have no hard feelings. I was like, I've gotten over it and I've learned and I like, and it's, and it just sucks that it happened. But like, it hurts me more to hold a grudge against somebody. Like it hurts me more at the end of the day. What kind of therapy were you involved in? Okay. So my parents sent me to a Christian based therapy program and the lady with the therapy, the way she approached it was more like not oh, this happened to you, but it was more of just because this happened doesn't mean you're gay. Mm -hmm. And so my mind is already like, I don't know what I am. Like, I I know I like boys. Like, I don't don't know. And so she's just like, it just wasn't like, you know. And so at the end of the time, like by the end of the session, I kind of just lied and was like, yeah, everything's great. Like- (laughs) How many sessions did you go to? I I had to go to her for like, I think it was like a whole year. It was my whole seventh grade year. I had to go to her, like, I think it was every Thursday. And like, I remember that because I would like come and like, I had an excuse note, so I would come to school late. Mm. Um, And so I would start on Thursdays. I would miss my first period because my counseling services were Thursday every morning with this like private Christian counselor lady. Um, And so, um, yeah, that, that's basically how that happened. And then like, after that, I was just like, oh my God, like, I don't know. Like, I'm just like so confused. Like it just didn't help. Um. But the, the, like the whole like HIV scare was like gone. Cause like the lady cleared that up with me and she was like, that's not, uh, that's not how that works. And so, cause I, that was the first thing I asked her. I was like, I think I might have HIV. She was like, excuse me, what? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, like my parents told me this. And she was like, that baby, that's, that's not how that works. She was like, it's not just automatically just comes out of nowhere. Um, and so, um, then after that, like, I just kind of was just really confused about, like, myself. Um, and then I, by 11th, I think 11th grade, uh-huh. I came out as gay. Who did you come out to? For my me? family. No, first people I came out to were my friends at school. Yeah. Everybody in my school knew I was gay. By 10th grade, I was out. I was I was gay gay. Like, I was, like, flaming. Like, <laughs> I dyed my hair. Like, I wore, like, bright color. Like, it was, like. And what were your parents oof. saying about all this? And like, here's the thing. I, um. I would like get ready because they were already gone. And so like I would get ready or I would change on the bus. Mm. And so like I would like change on the bus because like, mind you, I lived in Danville, Virginia. Like it has like three active Ku Klux Klan groups. Like it's like very bad, really racist, like not a safe place for queer people. Like I stopped visiting because I felt like I was losing myself every time I went to go visit because I had to bring it down. I had to tone it down because to protect myself. Um, And so mind you, I'm like, at this point, I'm like, I don't care. I'm gonna live my truth. I'm happy. So I was just getting ready on the bus or getting ready in the bathroom in the morning at school and just like living my life and changing. How would you change your clothes? Um, I would like just wear like, (laughs) I would like layer. I would like layer clothes. So like, let's say I would wear like really tight jeans and then I would like put like baggier pants on top Mm. or like if I like wanted to wear like a tighter shirt, I would just put like a sweater on and then just be like, Oh, and then I would get on the bus and be like, Oh, I'll take all this shit off. Like, I don't want this. Like, Mm -hmm. and then, um, then 11th grade on Christmas day, I came out to my family. How did that go? Okay. It was an elaborate, it's actually really funny how it happened. It was so elaborate. Cause in 11th grade, I had started doing YouTube and like at the time coming out videos were the thing. Like, People like recording their parents coming out reaction. It was like, this is like YouTube content. Like, this is like crazy. Like, and so I was like, okay, how am I going to do this? So what I did was I found my baby clothes that I wore when I came home from the hospital. I found pictures of me from 
The day I came over from the hospital, well, my parents' wedding, the day I came over from the hospital, all the way up until my high school graduation pictures, because, you know, you take those in 11th grade, because you like, it's mm-hmm. weird. Um, and so I, like, wrote this poem and put all these pictures in this scrapbook. I mean, it was the gayest thing I could think of. Like, put all these pictures in the scrapbook, scrapbook, and on the last page in pink glitter, it said, I'm gay. <laughs> and so I wrapped it up. And like I had also had got that was the first year I had my first job. I worked at Aeropostale. And so I had had money to buy people presents. So what I did was I bought everyone presents and then I had that present. And so when Christmas went around, like our, the way our house was, we have two Christmas trees. So we would do Christmas upstairs and then we'd go downstairs to do Christmas downstairs, which is the nicer gifts. Like upstairs is like underwear, socks, shirts, clothes, mm-hmm. stuff you don't really care about. And then <laughs> downstairs is like the good stuff. Mm-hmm. And so what I did was we had Christmas upstairs and then I was like, oh, I'm going to save my one present for the end. So I was like, let me get all my gifts first, just in case it doesn't go the way <laughs> I needed to go. And I'm like, you already gave it to me. You can't take it back. No, so no like, take-backs. No takesy backsies. Like, and so I... We opened the gifts upstairs and then, thank you, we opened the gifts um, downstairs and then we went back upstairs and I was like, okay, I have a gift. And I pulled it out from behind the couch. Mind you, I had my phone set up in the corner of the room to record this for YouTube. Um, And I opened the, um, I brought the box up and the way every, I won't forget how everyone was sitting. Who was there? Okay, so it was, they were on the white couch that no one sits on except for special events. And my mom, it was my mom on the left, my dad on the right. My brother was behind my dad and my sister was behind my mom. Um, And so they opened the book and they're all going through it. They're like, oh, oh, my mom's like, babe, do you remember this picture? Oh, do you remember this? Oh, like, and like, I mean, they were just like, oh, this is so cute. Oh my God. And then it gets to the last page and my mom flips it and it's silent. And my sister goes, like, she like was like, oh. And then my brother was like, I knew it. And then my dad was like, uh. And then my mom slams the book and starts crying, like hysterically crying. And then runs into the backyard and starts crying. And she's like, God, where did I go wrong? Like, where did I go wrong? And then I'm like, oh. Oh, man. And like, mind you, the video is a recording. And I'm just like, I'm like, it wasn't how I wanted it to be. It wasn't as dramatic. Like, cause the YouTube videos were like dramatic, like, oh, I'm disowning you. Like you're, and so it was just, oh, okay. My mom ran her off crying. And my dad's just sitting here like on the couch with his eyes like wide open. Like he saw a ghost. And then like my brother's laughing and my sister's laughing. And so I was like, okay, this isn't working. So I tried to make it more dramatic. <laughs> So I was like, y'all hate me. No one loves me. Like my life is over. And I'm like angsty high schooler. Like, oh my God, the world is ending. And like, I like take the phone and storm upstairs, recording myself crying. I wish I could find the video. It's it's gone now. Uh But like, I'm like in the bathroom crying. And then my dad comes upstairs and he comes into like my room and he's like, hey, He's like, I just want you to know that like, you know, he's like, you've never seen me preach against gay people. He's like, you've never seen me like, he's like, our mm-hmm. neighbors are gay and I hang out with them. He's like, I've never said that I hated gay people. He's like, all I want from you, and this is this is what got me. He's like, all I want from you is to respect me and your mom, live a good life. And then the last thing he says, don't cut your dick off. And I was like... I was like, well, thanks. Like at the time, cause I had already known, you know what I'm saying? I was like, dang, like now I got to come out again. Like, like I'm like, shit. Like I was so frustrated. I was like, Ugh. I was like, you can't win with these people. And so I was like, okay, whatever. And I was like, maybe just like me thinking I'm trans is just like a phase. And I'm thinking this because I follow these YouTubers and I'm like, maybe I want to be like them. Like, so mm-hmm. I just kind of just talk the trans out of my head. Um, and so, then, so you were 19 at this time, right? At that time, I was actually, I was in 11th grade uh, when that happened. So 17 ish. Yeah, I was in 11th grade. And then, so now, like. Had you had any, did you ever have relationships with the opposite gender? No. <laughs> did you have relationships with the same gender? Yes. Okay. Um, so I had, well, and the thing is, they weren't even relationships. They were just like closeted boys in my school who liked me and then just wanted to mess around in the bathroom. And then when their friends saw, found out that like things are going down south, they're like, oh no, like, no, nah, he's just obsessed with me. Like, it's not even like that. Those kind of people. So these, um, these closeted people, were they, because you hear different stereotypes about closeted people. Mm-hmm. Were they like the sports players? Were they, how- See, I went to like a magnet high school, so we didn't have really sports. So mm-hmm. everyone there was like either like an anime nerd or like ran track or did theater. 
Did so they, like, did they approach you or how, how did it happen? So here's the thing. I, when I say I was open about myself, I was so open in high school in 11th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. I was like gay, gay. Like I was like mm-hmm. the only one in my whole school, mm-hmm. like, like in the South, like that's like rare. Like mm-hmm. I'm saying for someone to be in high school and be like, I I'm happy with myself. Like I'm like, and so like people like radiated to that. Mm-hmm. And it was weird because with my high school, I wasn't bullied for being gay. I was praised for being gay because like, I was like, I own this. I run this school. Like I get away with what I want because I'm not scared to be myself. Mm -hmm. And so that was like the approach that I had. And so guys would just be like, oh, well, like obviously like Ken's the popular one. So let me just like, you know, people aren't going to think that I'm like sus if Mm -hmm. I like hang out with Ken. They just think that I want to be popular because I'm hanging around Ken. So Mm -hmm. people were like smart with the way that they approached it. And also because my friend group was predominantly women, girls. So they were either like, oh no, like I hang out with Ken because like he gets me with all the girls, like Ken hooks me up with all the girls. But in reality, you was trying to hook up with Ken. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Like oh that's what God. you were really trying to do. Um, and so then like, it just like, it was like boy after boy after boy. And then I was like, okay, I'm over this. Like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like I'm tired of high school boys. Like, and that just like stopped with high school boys. Um, I think what really stopped was like, there's this guy, I'm not going to say his name. Um, there was this guy that... I went to high school with, and if you follow me on YouTube, you can go search in the archives and you will find him. What's your YouTube username? Um, uh, my YouTube username, I think it's still Kennedy K. Okay. I think it's Kennedy K. Yeah. Everything is either Miss Kennedy K or Kennedy K, one of the two. Um, but on there, if you scroll down, cause I purposefully didn't delete old videos of me because like, it's my like history. Like it's like, mm-hmm. I used to vlog every single day in high school. My friends used to pick on me cause I would always have my camera out recording something. Like I recorded every single day. I would record Monday, Tuesday, upload Wednesday, record Wednesday, Thursday, upload Friday, and then record Saturday, upload Sunday and not record on Sunday. Like that was my life for like the last two years of high school. Um, And so there was this guy like, I was so obsessed with him and like, obviously like he liked me a lot, but he was like, no, like I'm not gay, but like we can have a bromance. And I was like, so you're calling it a bromance? We literally hold hands walking across the street to the library and you call this a bromance? Cool, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and so prom comes around, senior prom. And he asked me to prom and I was like, yeah, I would love to go to prom with you. His dad finds out. Mind you, his dad is a conversion therapy pastor. No way. Mm-hmm. I picked them well, don't I? Um, his dad's a conversion therapy pastor, and then his dad found out. And then so the guy was like, oh, no, like, we're not going as, like, boyfriends. We're just going as friends. Like, we're going stag, but we're, like, going as friends. And then his dad was like, no, that's gay. Like, people are going to think you're gay because, like, you're going with a gay kid to prom. Like, it's kind of obvious. Like, you're going to look gay. So his dad made him go to not go to our prom. He made him go to prom at the neighboring high school with this girl that he went to church with, and now they're married. So, and he's also fat and balding, so it makes me happy. Um, but, <laughs> but like, I'm like, look at me, like, I look good, and good job. Um, <laughs> and so like, that happened, and then I think I was just like, okay, I'm done with boys um, at the time. And then I graduated, went to college. where did you go to college? Um, Virginia Commonwealth University. How was that experience? Oh my God. I I love VCU. I miss everyone so much. Like I like miss them to death. Like what, what was your major? Uh, I majored in theater. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I um, like I did, I did dance minor um, mm-hmm. for like classes and stuff. I actually never completed the degree, but I got enough credits to be a dance minor. So I say I'm a dance minor. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I went to the classes. I just wanted to graduate on time. And if I had done that, I would have had to stay an extra semester. And I was not trying to stay in the South for an extra semester. I couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um. And so I went to school, went to school for that, um, made a really tight close friend group that I still talk to to this day. Like we are like brothers and sisters, like we're like really tight. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I lived my life. Like, so then when I went to college, so rewind, sorry. Um, High school, I started watching RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was like, oh my God, I love drag queens. Like, I'm like, I love it so much. Like, I'm like fascinated. And then, so I was like, oh my God, let me try drag. Let me dabble in drag. So I was like trying drag. And like, that was when I first started like cross-dressing. I was like, I had got my first debit card. And so I would buy things on eBay and like hide them in the basement. And when my parents were gone, I would like dress up and be like, "Mm, I look good. Mm -hmm. Um, And then put it away when they show up. Um, 
And then I went to college and I took all that stuff I was buying and put it in a tiny suitcase with my college stuff. And my parents were unpacking and my mom was like, oh, you want me to unpack that suitcase? Okay, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. That's just like toiletries and stuff. I'll handle it later. So I just snuck it. I put it under my, because they're like lofted beds. I put it under my mm-hmm. desk and I was like, that's it. Um, and then my school has this thing called No Shame Variety Show. Um, and it's hosted by the theater department for the students, by the students. Um, and it's basically a every other Friday variety show where the students like go home. They like they're at home. They do their pregame. And then they go to this thing where people can sign up every other week and do whatever they want. Judgment free. That's why it's called No Shame. Hmm. Um, and so they were I was like, oh, my God, I should do drag for No Shame. Mm-hmm. And mind you, they had never had someone do drag at No Shame in the history of No Shame. They're like, we've never had someone do drag. So I was like, I'm going to do it. Um, and that video also exists. Um, so, I like- so, you know, um, I had a patient a couple of weeks ago who told me that she started dressing as a female male signed at birth during Halloween. And she said many people start coming out that way or feeling it out. Did mm-hmm. you ever do that? No. Okay. Like I like Halloween was just like another day for me. I was like, oh, like, cause I was always so like, ah, like Halloween was just like, Extra glitter, like it was just like a little bit on top. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone knows I do Halloween extra. Like my past Halloween costume was $250. I had a custom made Dallas Cowboys cheerleader costume. Like I I take Halloween very seriously. (laughs) Um, But we, um, so no shame happened. I did my first ever drag show and I felt so good. Even though I looked so bad, People were like, yes, queen, yes, slay, hunty, yes, queen, you're giving me my life. But now I look back at it, I'm like, no. I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, but like, it was, I, it was the first time I was able to like express myself like in any form of being a female in front of a large amount of people. And it just made me feel good. And I felt welcome. And I felt like I was just myself. And so what I did was, I, after that no shame performance, hey, after that no shame performance, I um, decided to go to the gay club and start performing. Hmm. Um, And then I would always have my friends come with me and I would perform. And then I kept doing every single no shame after that all the way until I graduated. Okay. And every single no shame. I performed in drag and like, I basically became the resident drag queen of no shame. Like people are like, oh, we're going to go see. Cause at the time my drag name was Violetta Sparks. And they're like, oh, we're going to go see Violetta Sparks perform. Like she's good. And I would literally tell, get so many people. It would be packed. What, like, what and, would you do during your performance? Uh, so I'm mainly known for dancing. So like mm-hmm. I dance, I, I dance my butt off. Like I, I'm mm-hmm. a really good dancer. Um, and so people were like, oh, no, we're going to see Violetta. Like, I would, like, just have tons of people show up. Um, and so, like, it was just, like, it became a thing. And I was like, oh, my God, like, this is great. Um, and then so I actually started building my drag name, like, in the Richmond drag scene mm-hmm. and at VCU. And so um, by the time I became a senior, well, rewind, um, by the time I got to junior year of college, I came out, I came out as trans to my whole school. Hmm. So I had did a performance of um, Land of Lola from Kinky Boots, the musical. Um, And after my performance, I walked over to the microphone because usually I just like say a little something like, hey, guys, Mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming. Like, And I went over and I literally was like, hey, guys, I have something to say. I was like, I know I've like pulled myself away from people for a while. Like I've just been having a lot that I've been battling mentally and like trying to find myself as a person. And I was like, and I think it's about time I should tell you guys that I identify as a transgender woman. And when I said that, the whole auditorium, all 450 kids got up and started screaming and cheering for me. And I cried. Wow. Um, and a guy that I had a crush on was a trans man. He's a trans man. His name's Anthony. He's great. Mm-hmm. Um, he came on stage and hugged me. Wow. And he was just like, I'm proud of you. He was like, He's like, you're going to go places. He's like, you're going to grow. He's like, I can already see you're going to become a beautiful woman. He was like, I, he's like, I'm like so proud of you. Cause he was the only other trans person I knew Hmm. and he transitioned at a young age. Um, and so he was the only trans person I knew. And like, he like that kind of was just like, oh my God, like, yes. Um, were you doing any therapy or counseling at this time? No. Okay. Mm -mm. Um, the only advice I had gotten about being trans was from like, drag queens like people like older people but like oh like because like he was only trans person knew my age but there were like a lot of trans drag performers at the club obviously like that had been there for years and they're like oh girl you think you trans like you need to get on the moans girl like like very much that and so um basically after that i was like okay i was like so 
now what do I do? And then, so my senior year of college, I started, like, when I came back, I fully presented as female. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, changed my student ID. Like, I still keep it because, like, it was, like, it means a lot to me. Like, I went to the department and I was, like, I need to change my name and I need to change my picture on my ID. And so I did that. Um, and they had no problem with it because my school is very, like, queer friendly and, like, they mm-hmm. try to create safe spaces and, like, they even have this sticker. It's, like, a triangle with a rainbow on it and, like, different people put outside their office and this is a safe space for queer people to come. So my school is very inclusive. Mm-hmm. So that really helped with me finding myself because I went to a school that was very, like, artsy-fartsy, liberal, like, we mm-hmm. love queer people. Um, so I felt safe all the time on my campus. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it came to medically transitioning, I was so scared. Because I hadn't told my parents I was trans. And your dad made that comment. You must mm-hmm. have been thinking about it. Exactly. So I was living as trans at school. But when break came, I was back to being a boy. And what were they saying about you being gay when you were going Oh, home? my parents were fine with it. Like my like my par- my mom. So for the longest, my mom like didn't talk to me. Um, but then once I went to college, she realized like her child is gone. And, like, I guess she was like, I don't want to ruin this relationship just because my child is, like, different. Different. Um, But she was, like, really on my side after that. Like, we're, like, really close. We're still close now. Um, But I didn't come out as trans to them until one day I was, like, having a whole mental breakdown moment because I felt like I was just living a lie. I was like, Mm. I was like, I feel horrible because I get to live my truth here in Richmond, Virginia. Then I drive three hours south and I have to be a boy. I was like, and pretend like I'm like this like country bumpkin, vineyard vines wearing preppy little boy. And I was like, this isn't me. And so finally I called my parents on the phone while I was in college and I like came out to them. And then um, my parents were kind of like, you're just confused. And I was just like, great, thanks. Like, and it's like, I hung up and then I still ended up living my life. And when I came home, like I said, I still wasn't living my truth. Um, How were your siblings about all this? uh, My siblings... (laughs) My my brother just is very indifferent about everything that I do. Hmm. Like my brother just has no emotion. Like my, my brother's very much like, I'm chill, do what you want. Like it doesn't affect me. You're cool. But my sister very much like was strict Christian, like, oh, that's not okay. Like you're not a girl. Like like growing up, my sister would make comments and be like, That's you're what you're doing, that's girl. Girls don't wear makeup. Girls don't so my my sister is very much like my dad. Like my sister was like, Oh, girls don't wear makeup. Cause when I was in high school, I would wear makeup. Like my senior year, I was doing like eyebrows, like foundation. Like it wasn't good, but I was like, thought I was cute. And my sister always be like, Girls don't boys don't wear makeup. Boys shouldn't wear makeup. You shouldn't be wearing makeup. Like, why are you doing this? And so, like, when I like told, cause I okay, so the way I I came out as trans basically three times. Like the first time, mom was like, you're confused. Second time, I went home for Christmas break. And then I told my brother and sister first. I was like, hey, I'm transgender and I want, I want to start medically transitioning. But at the time, I still hadn't done it. I was like, I want to start medically transitioning, blah, 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 blah. And they were like, okay, we love you no matter what. Boom. That was it. The next day, my parent, no, the same day, my parents come home and I sit them down because I was like, let me give my siblings the pep talk. That way they can be on my side when it's time to battle the boss, my parents. Mm-hmm. So we get my parents show up and then we sit my parents down and they're like, so it was just so bad. Like it, like it was a horrible day for me. It, it was Christmas Eve and it was horrible. Like my parents were yelling at me and like, I was like, I don't feel good. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel safe here. And then when I told them I was going to leave and go back to school and not be here for Christmas, like they were like, if you take the car, we're going to say it's stolen because it's in our name. And then, so I was like trapped. Like I couldn't leave. Cause I was like, well, if I leave, then I go to jail because they'll say I stole the car. And we're in the South. So they're going to believe anything that someone says is they pull over a black male and be like, oh, this car is stolen. They're mm-hmm. not going to listen to me and be like, oh, no, my parents didn't understand that I'm trans. And so I'm going back home to school. <laughs> like, they're not, they're going to be like, no, shut up. Like, you know what I'm saying? They're not going to care. Yeah. Um, and so I just like stayed home. That was like the worst Christmas ever. And then I, um, and then so after that, I was like, okay, well, I guess I can't be trans. Like, like, I guess I can't. So then I. Stop presenting female and started presenting male. So you felt because you didn't have your parents' approval, you couldn't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I stopped being quote unquote trans. I stopped being trans, whatever you want to call it. And like, I like presented male for the rest of my senior year. 
And then were people asking you what's going on? Your no, my friends are very understanding, and my friends still use she her pronouns. Everyone around me still use she her pronouns or they them pronouns. Like they, everyone back at school really is the reason why I am who I am today because they really helped me. Like my best hmm. friends, Zuri, Tevin, Calvin, like they really, really, really helped me, um, and they made me feel comfortable and made me feel safe. Um, and so they were always like, oh yeah, Kennedy. Cause I was like, I want to go by Kennedy pronouns, she, her, or they, them, whichever you feel. And like, they made sure that they made me feel comfortable. And like, they made me like, feel like, you know, like I had a family. So they were like my family. Um, and so I just, but I was just like, I don't know if I can medically transition and then have to deal with going home. And then my parents were like, something looks different. Something's off. And then it just being a whole nother situation. Um, because Fun fact, I went to Planned Parenthood to actually get hormones in college and I punked out and left when they called me back. They were like, oh, okay, mm. Kennedy. And like, I literally got up and walked out. I was like, I'm sorry, I can't. And I left and I cried in the car because I was like, I can't do it. Like, I'm scared. Um, And so I just lived my life as a male for the rest, as a gay male for the rest. And then I got an internship in Seattle mm -hmm. Um, and it was... um. Courtney Sale, she came to my school and she interviewed our business to theater program. And I had already done a lot of children's theater. And I was like, I want to like get more into children's theater. Mm -hmm. And she's like, we have a great internship program in Seattle. Have you ever been to Seattle? I was like, no, I haven't been to Seattle. But like, if it means getting across this whole side of the country, I will do it. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so we did the interview and I got, I got it on the spot. She was like, she was like, Ken, you're, you're affectionate. Like you're great. Like you have such a great energy. She was like, you would love this job. So I graduated, moved out my, my house in Richmond Literally the next week I was on a plane to Seattle. I sold all my stuff. Like I moved here with only $2,000 to my name. I was like, I, I was like, if I would do anything I can to get out of this place, I need to leave. Where did you live? I, I at the time I was living in Richmond, Virginia, but then I had to stay at my parents' house for a, a week in Danville. Mm. I was like, I got to get out of here. I was like, I have to go. I have to leave. Like I, I would do anything it takes to get out of here. So I sold my PS5. I sold my, no, not PS4, my PS4. I sold all my furniture. I sold every single gaming device I owned. I sold my DSLR camera that I used to make YouTube videos with. I sold everything I owned to make money to get a plane ticket to get to Seattle. Um, mind you, and I also to get an Airbnb to last me a month because I had nowhere to live. Hmm. Um, so I moved here. I stayed in the Airbnb for a month while I was, it was in Burien. Um, it was a lovely couple. Like they were amazing. Um, I stayed there. Um, and then I kind of just like, was like myself and just, you know, like, but still I was so identifying as a gay male. And like, I was just like, Oh, like I'm like having so much fun, like meeting great children. Um, and then what was your internship? Uh, it was, I was a, a teaching assistant, um, for Seattle children's theater. Um, mm -hmm. basically they have a program where like, you're like a summer teaching assistant and you help with the teaching artists with like, basically you're the kid Corrala. You like get the schedule, like you like pick up the kids, take them to the class, take them to their meals, mm -hmm. bring them back to the class, go to drop off. So like, you're like the help, like you're like their best friend all day mm -hmm. when they go to all these different teachers. Yeah. How are you making friends and getting to know people in Seattle? So um, basically all of the interns that I work with were fake mm -hmm. and I don't like any of them. And they were all really mean. Um, I was expecting, oh, these are theater kids. Like they're going to be really outgoing and not, they were all like just introverts. And like, they just didn't like the fact that I was just like out there. I was like, oh my God, guys, like, like I, we would like have. We would have a day and I would be like, hey guys, message group chat, want to go like go get a drink or something or like want to go get food or something. Oh no, we're busy. Oh no, I'm going home. I'm tired. And then I would like see on Snapchat that they're all hanging out mm -hmm. at like Gasworks or like something like that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm literally been trying so hard to be you guys' friend. Why? Like I, and that, that's the thing. Like, and then we would have our little intern meetings every Wednesday and like we would all sit. And then one day I came, I was just fed up. I was like over it. Like I was like, I'm literally trying to be your friend and you are purposefully being mean to me for no reason. I don't know why. Because I've done nothing but shown you guys niceness and kindness and compassion this whole time we've been here. Mm -hmm. And so I like got in the meeting and I was like, you all are fake. I was like, you all are bullies and you're mean. I was like, and I don't need to make friends with people that are going to return back to their shitty hometowns at the end of this internship. And then so I basically like just started going out to the clubs. <laughs> making friends. I was like, I'm going to make friends the natural way. And so like, I like the first club I went to was our place. And like, I went to our place and I was like making friends that way. And I was like, Oh, like you're cool. And like hanging out with people like that. So how would you just go up to people and start talking? To yeah. Them? I'm like, I'm not scared to talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, I would just go to people like, Hey, I like your shirt. 
I'm like, I'm not flirting with you. I just don't have friends. Like, <laughs> like, like very much like that. Like I would like start the conversation. Like I'm not flirting with you. I just don't have friends. Mm-hmm. And then most people would be like, oh, okay. Like come dance with us. And then like, but like, Hey, can I get your number? We should hang out sometime. And then like, mm-hmm. it just like happens that way. Um, sadly, none of those friends ended up clicking. Like, like they were just like temporary friendships. So like, I was like, oh, well it's cool. Like I met this person. It's really cool. Um, and then I started, um, so the internship finished and I was like, I'm going to like stay. Like, I felt like I was like, I'm going to stay. I was like, I'm not going back. I'm staying. Mind you, I was only making $200 a week. And I was like, I'm staying. How are you living? So I had reached out like, cause I, like I said, I'm not scared to talk to people. I reached out and one of the people on the board of directors was like, Hey, you can stay at my house. So I was living at her house in Magnolia for like a couple of weeks. Um, And then um, after that, one of the children that was in one of my classes, her mom was like, Izzy, like her name's Sally. Sally is the best. She's like the most like loving, caring like woman. Mm -hmm. I've like, ah, she's like my Seattle mom. That's what I call her. Cause she Mm -hmm. really helped me like be able to stay here. Um, And so I was like, yeah, like I need a place to stay now. And she was like, oh my God, no, Sally. Sally was like, oh, Izzy loves you. Izzy's her daughter. She's like, Izzy mm-hmm. talks about you so much. She's like, Izzy would come home and be like, oh my God, no, Kim was the best. Like, Kim's the best teacher ever. Like, at all of the drama school classes I've had, Kim is like literally the best. Um, and so um, basically I became like Izzy's like stay home babysitter. So I was mm-hmm. like living there, but her mom was providing me a place to stay and food and paying me. Because she also cares that mm-hmm. much. Like, she's like, I care. She's like, I don't have to do this, but like. I want to do this. Mm-hmm. She's like, I like, like, you know, like I'm giving you a place to stay and a like place to eat, like food to eat. But like, I also want to help you get financially stable so you can like live your life here in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, so I stayed there for a while. It was great. And then like, I met a couple of friends uh, just like over the internet, like over like housing groups. And like, we would like hang out and they're like, Hey, come live with us. And so like, I like moved out and then live with them. Um, and then, so like, yeah. What, what were you doing for work? Um, at the time, besides being the nanny, like nothing. But mm-hmm. then I also was doing drag. Like that, that was a thing. I was like performing all over Seattle, um, making a name for myself. Cause I was like, I was big in Virginia. I was like, I was like known. Mm-hmm. Like my last show that I performed, it was a packed house. Mm-hmm. Like I walked out with a thousand dollars in tips because people were like, oh no, you're leaving. Like it was like that. So I was like, I can, it's easy. I've been doing this for six years now. I can, I can mm-hmm. make a name for myself in Seattle. Um, so I just started performing everywhere. And then um, I think the performance that really like set it for me in Seattle was I performed at Queer Bar at one of their brunches. Um, and one of the queens, her name is Stacey Starstruck, like she gave me like an opportunity because she had never seen me perform before. Mm-hmm. And I showed up to one of the brunches and I was like, let me, I like I, my boyfriend, I showed up and I was like, I was like, let me show you. I will show you how you get a booking as a drag queen. So we show up. I have a $50 bill. She shows up. I tip her with the $50 bill. I look her in the eyes. I showed up in full drag, hands her the $50 bill. And I was like, there you go. And after the show, what she do? Come straight to my table. She's like... You gave me $50. I said, I sure did. Mm-hmm. I was like, and you should book me here. <laughs> so, and she was like, have you performed her here? I was like, no. I was like, but you should book me because that I know I'm talented and I know I'm a good performer. I was like, you take my word for it. And so I did the performance and it was also my birthday at the same time. So I did the performance and I had brought, I packed half of the club. They had to add seats, mm. add tables because it was so many people. And, um, I had did the performance and everyone was like, oh my God. They're like, no one in Seattle performs like you. I was like, yeah. I was like, cause I know I'm good. Mm-hmm. I was like, and also like drag in different parts of the like United States is different. Like up here, they're like, oh, like, you know, like it's more alternative. But like where I come from, the drag is like big feathers, rhinestones, boas, big hair. Mm-hmm. Like it's just like the it's the the shock factor. Like that, like mm-hmm. that's like how it is. It's like, wow, like whoa. Like in, in the South, it's like you see a queen, the curtains open and your eyes are just like, whoa, take my money. Like versus like in Seattle, like they'll perform, but it's more of like shock of value through performance instead mm-hmm. of shock of value through aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um and so like no one up here had seen something like that. Um so like I had like skyrocketed really quickly. Um, and then I so you were making money doing shows. Yes, I was making money. Um, that was like my main source of income. And then I had uh, stayed. I had stayed working at the theater, but it was only part time. And I was working in the box office, mm-hmm. so I was doing part time box office work, but doing drag mostly. Um, and then I and were you on hormones at this time? Uh, okay, so no, not yet. 
<laughs> uh, at the time, I was still presenting male um, because then the way it had came to me was when I came to Seattle, I was like, no one's going to love me if I'm trans. Like people think I'm a hot guy. So I might as well stay a hot guy and get a relationship as a hot guy. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, and so like it was more fear of being alone because mm-hmm. it's a scary world out there in the dating scene for trans women. It really is. Either like with trans women, it's like either they like see you and they're like, oh my God, you're so hot. And then you're like, I'm actually, I'm trans. Like what? I would have never knew that. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't do that. Like, that's crazy. And it's like, okay, but you literally thought I was so hot like 10 seconds ago. And I told you that I'm trans and you're like, oh, and like I'm done with it. Mm-hmm. It's like, or they're like, I've always wanted to be with a trans girl. Like I'm so into trans girls. Like it's so hot. Like I want you to dominate me. Like I'm so insane. And so it's like either fetishizing me or like, they're just like not here for it. Um, so I was like, I might as well just stay a guy. And like, I was unhappy. I was really unhappy. Mm-hmm. But the reason I kept doing drag and performing so much in drag was because I got that euphoric feeling I had mm-hmm. presenting female. And I loved it when people were like, oh my God, you're pretty. Oh my God, you're gorgeous. So I constantly was like, I should do drag. So I just kept pushing my, like, like I like kept doing drag to make myself feel better about like not accepting myself as a person. Um... And so I eventually started hormones because I kind of was like, I'm just ready to do it. How did you start them? So I went to Planned Parenthood. Did they require counseling? Nope. I went to Planned Parenthood. I walked in. I said, I am trans. I need my hormones now. Like I was so demanding. And I was like, I'm ready. And they were asking me questions. They were like, you know, the other-. I was like, I don't care. I was like, I've waited too long and I've made myself not happy with myself. I want them now. Mm-hmm. And so they prescribed me and I literally went to the pharmacy the same day and got my hormones. Um, how did you feel with that? Oh my, I was so happy. I literally called my best friend Zuri in the car and cried. I was like, mm-hmm. I'm finally doing it. Cause my best friend Zuri, she pushed and pushed. She was like, girl, she's like, be happy, be yourself. And she kept telling me that in college. She was like, fuck your parents. Fuck what they say. Like, be happy. Did you tell them or no? Uh, so I hadn't told my parents. No, nope. I like, I moved here and I was like, I'm a transition and they gonna never know. Cause they're going to talk on the phone and I could just make my voice a little deep. Mm-hmm. Like they'll, they'll never know. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so um, basically I like started medically transitioning. Um, it was on September 1st of 2019 um, when I first got my hormones. Um, and so I started medically transitioning and then I stopped medically. Tra- I know my body hates me right now, but I stopped medically transitioning because I was in a bad living situation. Mm. I had a roommate. And the thing about people forget, especially with trans women and medically transitioning, is like your brain goes through a lot. Mm -hmm. Your brain is literally like chemically reversing itself, basically chemically changing itself. Mm -hmm. And so I was having my moments. I was having my little sensitive moments and stuff. But then he like kind of like put into the other roommates' heads that like I was like crazy and like kept telling them that he was like, oh, we need to tell. Uh, And so one day he sat me down. He was like, Kennedy, he was like, I'm giving you an ultimatum. We're going to kick you out or you're going to stop hormones. He's like, because the hormones are making you crazy. And like, I felt so unsafe. I was like, wow. So it's like that. But at the same time, I was like, I can't be homeless. Like, I have to stay in Seattle. Like, I have to. So I stopped taking my medicine. I was like, if that is what it takes for me to like exist, I was like, I'll stop. So I just quit cold turkey. But I still had them. I'm sorry. I still had all my medication. Like, Mm -hmm. I was like, it's still here. Um... And then so, like, I met my um, partner, and then we got in a relationship, but he met me as a gay man. Mm -hmm. Um, And then up two months before we ended up moving out, I, like, looked at him, and I was like, you know what? I was like, I can't do this anymore. And he was like, what? I was like... I was like, I'm transgender. And I was like, and I'm tired of living my life as a gay man because I'm not a fucking gay man, and I'm like, I'm over it. I can't do this anymore. Um, And so he... um, he was like, oh, well, he was like, I support you. He's like, I support anything. He was like, as if you're going to be a true self, that's fine. He's like, I support you 100%. He's like, I'm not going to not love you any different. He's like, like, you know, like if it makes you happy, it makes you happy. Um, and then so like that day I started taking my medicine again. And I was like, I'm going forward with it. I was like, I'm not letting anyone change my mind again. I'm not letting anyone make me feel like I can't be who I want to be and who I feel like I am and who I know I am. Um, and so I started medically transitioning. Um, and then I. Around like, let's see, I want to say June, June, July of like this year, I like had met a trans girl and like, she was like, girl, like, 
I'm getting my titties done. And I was like, oh, really? And she's like, yeah. Like, so you I'm, moved You moved in with your partner? Yes, we moved in together. And mm-hmm. so like, then I was just like hanging out. Then you started your hormones. Mm-hmm. And so pre-COVID, I was like hanging out with a lot of people, like definitely putting myself more around like trans people. Like my, like I can say my circle right now consists of the majority of like trans people, especially mm-hmm. trans women. Um, and they were just like, one girl was like, girl, I'm about to get my titties done. And I was like, oh, really? I was like, I've never like looked into that. And like mm-hmm. then all the girls at the same time, they were like, you need to go Dr. Sajan. They was like, Doctor, <laughs> they, were, they were like, Dr. Sajan, Dr. Sajan, he know the girls. <laughs> he know, he know the girls. Dr. Sajan know the girls. And so I was like, Okay, like it was like like I we we know the girls. He knows the girls. He mm-hmm. works on all the girls. And I was like, okay, who is this person? And so like I looked you up, and I was like, oh, okay. And then like what really got me mm-hmm. was um the the website. Like when I looked on the website, and there was a whole section for transgender. I was like, what the hell? I was like, mm-hmm. they got a section for us. This is fancy. Like mm-hmm. like because usually most like websites, it's like you know, um, it's on the side. It's, it's on, on the side the or, or or it's like. They don't have it, but it's like, well, if you come in, obviously we'll give you the procedure. It's not, you know. And so I was like, okay, the girls weren't lying. The girls mm-hmm. weren't lying. And so like I like did my research and I was like, I was like, this is the best option. I was like, this is the best one. And then so like I like did my like little So what research did you do? Do you look at my Instagram or Snapchat? So I looked at your Instagram. Um, I looked up YouTube videos. I like like I like did my research. I like looked on your website. Mm-hmm. And also the fact that there was a price list, I was like, oh, bet. I was like, like, because most people don't do that. Like most doctors you go to, they just throw you a ballpark price. And like, Mm -hmm. you might show up three months later and it might be a whole different ballpark price. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I like the fact that there were like base prices that could go up, but it's like, Hey, this is so to prepare yourself. This is what you're working with. This is Mm -hmm. the ballpark of what it it could be. Um, And so I was like, Oh my God, I'm gonna get my boobies done. And so I, uh, I kind of just like, like, I'm what made it. you feel that surgery was the right time? I was tired of wearing push-up bras. Mm. I was tired of stuffing. I was like, I'm tired. And also just, I hated the fact that like, if I just even wanted to run to 7-Eleven or if I wanted to just go downstairs and do something, I had to put on a bra because I was flat chested as all get out. Like I had like a little bit of something, but like, I was like, there's nothing here. I was like, my shoulders are too broad to be this flat chested. Mm-hmm. And I was like, giveaway (laughs) and so like i just like was every time i walked out the house like i would like walk like slouch shoulders like just because i was so scared or i would like layer up like Mm -hmm. with like a cardigan and stuff because i just wasn't comfortable with like my chest and i was like i like i just feel like this is something i need to do i'm tired of it like i'm over it Mm -hmm. um and so i was like let's do it and so i the first thing i did was i looked up financing options um, and I was like, cause I was like, I ain't got money. I, I can't pay for this. I was like, I know I can't pay for this. Um, and so then at the time I was like, oh, like there's like options. There's like plastic surgery credit cards. And so then I applied for care credit and got approved on the spot. And I was like, that's my sign. We going. Mm-hmm. I was like, we, I said, we going. And then I had did a GoFundMe. Um, and I was so surprised how quickly I reached my goal. How much were you raising? $10,000. Mm-hmm. I hit $10,000 within the span of five weeks. Wow. How were you getting people through your TikTok? It and all was that? just it was just people I've met in my life that have genuinely been like, you are such a great person. Like you're such a good spirit. And like people I've like kept close to me. And like people just like, I like, you know, just like treat I treat everyone nicely with like how I want to be treated. And so it just it like paid off. Like I'm not saying I was doing it to get it to pay off, but like it paid off without me wanting it to pay off. Like I like started to go fund me. I was like, it ain't gonna make no money. Within 24 hours, I had already made six thousand dollars. Wow! And, and you, you emailed your friends, or how did they know you were doing it? I just I posted it on my Facebook. That was it. I literally posted it mm-hmm. nowhere else but Facebook. And I posted on my Facebook, and like I was so shook at people. They were donating like five hundred dollars, six hundred. I was like, that's that's big chunks of money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And so people were like donating this, and like within a like a 24 hour span, I was already at six thousand. And then like I like shared it on my Instagram and then tons of people in the gay, gay queer community in Seattle, like Queens performers were just sharing it. And it was on everyone's social media. And so like every, all the performers were like, oh my God, like help Kennedy get her new, new boobies. Like everyone, everyone was sharing it. It was everywhere, all over the internet. I did not expect for it to blow up, but everyone was sharing it. But um, I think one of the things that really helped with it blowing up on Instagram was I had in... 
I want to say earlier that year, I think I forgot. I think it was March. March. I was I was crowned the Washington Entertainer of the Year. Really? Through yeah. What, what what organization? So it was a pageant, and it's through the Seattle Import Imperial Court, and like it was like a whole pre- competition. Like they had you had to get nominated to even compete, and I had only been in Washington not even a full year, and was like I'm competing, and then I won like the title of like the Entertainer of the Year, and like everyone was like. I can't do nothing with her and so I won that and so it had already like made people know who I was mm-hmm. and so like the GoFundMe came like three months after and everybody was like oh we know who that was Entertainment of the Year oh yeah 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 and so it just like shared and like made so much money and I was like wow like that's crazy like if you're nice to people it pays off look at that mm-hmm. like if you're just nice nice things happen to you um <clears throat> And so I had the money and I was like, I'm going in, I'm going to go get my boobies. Now, did you research other doctors or just me? Uh, I think I researched like other doctors, but like everyone kept telling me to go to you. Like, Mm -hmm. and like the the thing is, I believe word of mouth over the internet. Like Mm -hmm. if someone, if multiple people keep telling me to go to someone, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. How was your consult with me? Oh my God. So um, it was just amazing just because like, When you, like, enter a room, like, you make it feel, like, welcoming. Mm -hmm. Because, like, they're, especially, like, in the medical, like, it's scary. Like, Mm -hmm. it's scary. Like, I was, like, here, like, I look cute. I got my high heels on. I did my makeup. (laughs) I got my good hair in. But, like, I was scared. Like, I was, like, oh, my God. Like, this is crazy. Like, I'm about to do this. Like, mm -mm, this is scary. And so, like, I, like, showed up. And then, like, just the way you entered the room, I was, like, okay. He's like, he's like a good pe- person. Like you have like a really good spirit. And I was like, oh, I can feel the energy. Like this is going to be good. Thank you. Um, And so it was just like, I like felt very welcomed. Mm-hmm. And like, you just like, one thing I love is like, you're definitely a doctor where like you make someone feel welcome, but also you don't like fluff the conversation. Mm-hmm. You help me like figure out what's going to happen. Like what's like, what it's going to be. And like really like have any questions and like help answer those questions. And what, during your console, we did sizing. Yeah. So I, <laughs> you told me, I want to go big guy. I did. I went and I said, I want the biggest ones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like, I got the biggest ones and they're amazing. But like, I live with it. I was like, I was like, I, I was like, I want the biggest ones. I was like, I was like, what are they? She's like, it's 800. I was like, let's try it on. And I looked at it. I was like, oh, that's it. I remember uh, that. Like most people, like she was like, oh, most people like sit here and contemplate for like a good, like 15, 20 minutes. Like, oh, this one feels like, I, I said, uh-uh. I know what I want. And the thing is, because like it, one of the things I wanted it so bad, I knew. Mm-hmm. I was like, I want big boobies. When my assistant left the room within, like, it was five or 10 minutes, usually it's 20 to 30 minutes. I'm like, did you really do the sizing? <laughs> and she said, yeah. I'm like, uh, okay, let me go see what's going on. <laughs> and, uh, and so now your operation had some complexities involved in it. Mm-hmm. You wanted to go really big. And because you're ethnic like me, We didn't want to put a scar on your chest. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go through the armpit. Mm -hmm. Now, most doctors say you can't do more than 300 cc's through the armpit. You may have read about that. Mm -hmm. We did 800 cc's high profile through the armpit Mm -hmm. under the muscle. And the reason that's so hard is when you make that space for the implant, it has to be perfect, Mm -hmm. especially when you go through the armpit. There's zero room for error. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people prefer going through the fold. In you, I didn't want to do the fold approach because of the big scar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like, we can't do that. <laughs> exactly. And it might, it, it could hurt your performing mm-hmm. too. So we went through the armpit, under the muscle, 800. Did it, it was a big implant. Did it hurt? <sighs> oh my God. So it's so funny because it didn't hurt until later that day. I think it was the drugs to let me. Because um, funny story, I, after we left, I don't know if she, the nurse told you, but when I like got out, woke up, I stood up and walked to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Like full on, she was shook. She was like, wait. She's like, how are you doing this? I was like, girl, I got experience. Like, like I'm just like full on, like, I gotta pee and like go to the bathroom. And like I felt fine. I was like, I'm fine, like I'm good, like I can talk, like I'm not in big like crazy pain. Um, and then I got home and I ate five slices of pizza. Mm-hmm. Like, and they were like, oh, keep it like because they said before I left, they were like, oh, we'll try like clear liquids and then like try like you can mm-hmm. like do like soft foods. No, I got home and I was like, Domino's. Mm-hmm. And like I devoured the Domino's and within like, I kid you not, like a minute, it all came back up. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> that's why we said, we said, take it right. We told you. I like, I was like, oh, that food was so good. And I started watching TV and like, 
it was like a lot of movement and mm-hmm. it like made me sick. And then I just like project out, like all the oh. pizza came back up. And then my boyfriend's mom was like, see, I told you. I was like, I thought I was fine. And then like after that was when I started like having pain because the contractions, like mm-hmm. when you throw up, like your chest is like, and I was like, mm-hmm. ah. And like, that was when the pain started. Um, I think three. So then what happened was we ended up going to his mom's house. Cause like, she was like, I feel better if Kennedy's here. Cause like I can watch and then you, we can take turns. Like, this is a lot. Um, so I went to his mom's house in Bellevue and we stayed there, but oh my God, sleeping was horrible. Mm-hmm. Like it was just, and also sitting up, I felt like I had bricks on my chest and like I couldn't sit up on my own. So like we had to count and they had to like push me up mm-hmm. and like, at the time, like, I had this, like, because I'm very much an instant gratification type of girl. And, like, when I first saw them, I was like, they look horrible. I was like, I was like, they're at my chin. And, like, mm-hmm. they look so bad. I was like, am I botched? Like, <laughs> like full on having a whole mental breakdown. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I called my friend Anais, and she's a trans TikToker as well. And I was like, she got her boobs done earlier, mm-hmm. like, last year. And I was like, look how bad they look. And she's like, girl, calm down. One. She's like, number two, they're going to drop. Mm-hmm. She's like, number three, you just had the surgery yesterday. She's like, chill out. You weren't supposed to look at them the next day. Oh, no. The, no, no, no. It was the day you took the, when oh, I came back. After the post-op. Yeah, it was yeah, after yeah, the post-op. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did Because I didn't look at, it was after the post-op when the band had came off. Got it. Correction. Time error. Um, when the band had came off, when I finally got to look at them, I was like, oh my God, they look so bad. Because mm-hmm. I remember I was already off the pain meds by that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was able to like stand up and you take a shower on my own. And that was when I FaceTimed her. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God, like, look, they're horrible. Like, they look so big. Like, it's like dodgeballs on my chest. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. she's like, girl, they're going to get, they're going to look good. And then like, obviously they look good now. But um, at the well, time. When did you feel they started looking good? Um, I want to say like last week, week before last. Like when I finally started to saw, like I saw like, like the drop. I was like, mm-hmm. oh. And they're soft and they jingle. I was like, I was like, this is nice. Um, and so like I like definitely like, but the pain like went away, like after like two weeks, like like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, how how do you fine. feel about them now? Um, now I love them. They're great, they're amazing, they're fantastic. <laughs> um, I like definitely have much more confidence when I walk. I realize my posture isn't as slouched over anymore. Like I literally walk with my chest up because I'm like, look, mm-hmm. I pay for these. Mm-hmm. I'm still paying for these. Um, and so like I was like, like I'm very much more confident. Um, my like I'm happier. Like when I like go to take a shower, I like stare myself in the mirror, like, mm, girl, <laughs> you did that. And like it like really like changed my like my proportions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cause like before, like I was so dysphoric about my body. Cause I was like, oh my God, like I am shaped like a brick. I am shaped like a refrigerator. I was like, I cannot, I was like, this is bad. Like, I was like, I hate this. But then like when I got, once I got my boobs done, it was like, okay, wait, I look a lot different now. I was like, I actually have a little bit more of a curve than I did before, but it's because I'm not used to seeing like, you know, the top, it was more of like boom and like going out at the bottom. Um, and so, like, definitely, like, I my confidence is like skyrocketed. Is your dysphoria better? It's better, but uh, <laughs> we still have issues. Like, there's still things I want to get done because when I came to you, I I wanted like a BBL and breast augmentation, mm-hmm. um, which I still want to get. But I would tell myself I should wait. I should like space them out, which was the smart idea. And I remember like you tried, you told me that you're like, hey, maybe you should like wait. And then like when I had did the financing, like she was also like, maybe you should like wait. And mm-hmm. I was like, no, I want it now. Mm-hmm. And then when she was like, here's the price. I was like, I don't want it now. <laughs> <laughs> she was she like, it like, it like, it like changed. Like, she was like, here you go. And I was like, we're doing boobs. <laughs> and so like, I like went home and like really did some like, cause I had to give her answer. She was like, well, respond to me within like a couple, a couple of days. And I was like, okay, just give me time to think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was like, maybe if I could like, just like ap- apply for like three more credit cards and just run my credit up, like I could just have a banging body. And then I just kind of like came back to earth and was like, okay, girl, be an adult, like take it slowly. Like, like it's not going nowhere. Like you're, exactly. you're it's not going anywhere. Okay. Like, if you get it now, it's going to look the exact same way. If you get it, like, three months later, four months later. Um, so I definitely, like, was like, let's wait. And But, like, it definitely, when it comes to looking at my body, it's a lot better. Like, a lot better. If you could go back and give someone else advice, someone like yourself who's living in a conservative community, who feels their gender identity isn't congruent with their gender assigned at birth, if you could tell them one thing, what would it be? 
Um, if I could say one thing, it would be um, don't lose yourself. It might feel like that all everything around you is making you not want to be your true self, but it's possible to hold on to yourself as a person with your like your spirit, how you feel, but also tread lightly because it is a dangerous world out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if anything from like me telling my story, I that's what I did. I knew who I was. But I just played my cards the right way mm-hmm. because I was like, I told, I always told myself I will never be a number. I will never be a statistic. I will never just be a name on the back of someone's shirt. Mm-hmm. I was like, if someone's going to know my name, they're going to know my name and I'm going to make a name for myself. So may, just have that with you and like, make sure like never lose yourself, but like play your cards right. And if you play your cards right, you end up happier in the end. And that's what your story shows us. You went slow, steady. Yet you were determined. Mm-hmm. You were safe, cautious, but also willing to take a risk when the time was right. Mm-hmm. I have learned a lot. I know your ordeal will teach our listeners how and what to expect as they start their own cosmetic and plastic surgery journeys. I appreciate your time and I'm honored to have you as my good patient and I would say my friend. And I hope you feel that. Oh yeah, most definitely. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Plastic Surgeon Podcast and please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts to hear more great content. For my live surgeries on Snapchat and my adventures throughout the week, catch us on all social media. See you next time. Bam, one.